All right, everybody. If it is Tuesday, that means it is time for Comic Book School Live. And if you are here to talk about the craft and business of making comics, you've come to the right place. But tonight we have a very special episode. Tonight we wanted to take on a topic that is important to really all of us as creators, as readers, as fans of the medium. The fact that people come to us to ask us our opinion on what they should read. And this is a pretty big responsibility. When I was recently asked at a marketing conference, what comic should I read? I had to rack my brain. And I remembered that I had a process for introducing people to comics. And you should as well. Because if you introduce comics to people and they hate it, um, you may actually convert somebody who might have become a comic book reader into somebody who will never become a comic book reader. I will tell you, it is really difficult sometimes to recommend the right product for the right person. But if you ask, one more time, I'm going to use the word right. If you ask the right questions, you will be able to get to an answer and a recommendation, but you have to be committed. I'm committed and you're committed. You know who needs to be committed? Mike Fasolo, because he needs to get on this show and be backstage. He hasn't dialed in yet, but of course, that's partially my problem. A few of you may have noticed that uh, the guest that we had originally scheduled for tonight uh, was unable to join us. So quickly, we scrambled and we pulled this episode together. We hope that you like it and appreciate the, um, the effort that we put into this show for you. But as creators... Uh, sometimes you want to find out about what, can you guys hear me? Is this thing even on? I don't even know if this is on. Not working. All right. Fasolo says it's not working. Let's try it again. Like it's trying to get into the show. Okay. Let's try it one more time. Can you guys hear me? Here's my question. Do you prefer movies or TV? Patrick, that's a good starting one. And, uh, Patrick, I hope uh, everybody uh, was a big supporter of your Kickstarter because I saw that you did fund. Congratulations on that. Uh, about 13 years ago, I would just say Chew, the, the closest thing to a one-size-fits-all comic for beginners. I indeed like the comic Chew as well. It's a lot of fun, but not really for everybody. But that's why you have to ask some of the right questions. Okay, Patrick, you can hear me. Okay. So as Mike gets ready to somehow get into the show with me, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the problem is. Let me just see if I can uh, just talk amongst yourselves if you can. Um, Mike, did you just join us? There you go. What, did I give you a bad link? Well, I don't know. I clicked on the link and it was taking me to Safari and then it was saying it doesn't work on Safari, but I would click it in Chrome and it said nothing was there. Well, so Mike, I'm, I'm glad you're here though. Yes. I'm glad to be here too. So Mike, uh, this is the last of our, uh, or maybe one more week of hat month. I pulled out the coup de gras. I pulled oh, out the, look at that. Is that a, is that a beauty or what? Let's get That's a quick nice. Very that. nice. That is a genuine article. Um, <laughs> And yet you pulled out uh, something pretty spiffy as well. I I'm digging that. Wow. It's a, it's a flash hat. That is a flash hat. I'm so I fast. I hope that's all the flash flashing that you're doing. <laughs> oh, so, Plugo was about to pitch playing your stunt double. <laughs> Plugo, you're, you're welcome to come on anytime, and we will have you come back on. So, Mike, we wanted to cover an important topic today, and that is for people how to recommend comics to non-comic readers. Mike, why is this important? Are there people who are non-comic readers, bud? There are, there are indeed people who are non-comic readers. And, um, you know, it, it, is, it is often a movie or a TV series that gets somebody to be inspired. Or if you're a creator, they might say, hey, you make comics, you write comics, you draw comics. You know, you got anything I should read? And, you know, we as longtime comic readers can go, oh, I love the, you know, Chris Claremont, John Byrne run of the X-Men. You just can't recommend that easily. No. It's not easy for people to jump into. And I was thinking, eh, which works better? Lime in a ditch or a tub full of acid? Mike's back, so never mind. <laughs> wow, Glenn's really looking to get you 
get you out of the show, Mike. Uh, everybody wants my job. Plugo's got a Plugo's got a hat too. So we, uh, we what kind I, of hat does he have? I don't know. Plugo, what kind of hat do you have? And I got a free bowl of soup with my hat. Ah, mm-hmm. Caddyshack reference. Caddy well Shack. done, yeah. sir. Well done. So, Mike, what what are the, what's the de- I would say the danger of recommending the wrong comic is that somebody might read it and go, I guess I don't like comics after all. Yes, and then they will stop immediately and never pick up another one. Right, and you know, then your recommendations, you can go, oh, let me try give you something else to try. They're not interested anymore. Yeah, and it's, chance. like you said, it's tough with something like just say the X Men because it has such an epic run that you you know just picking it up in the middle. They won't get it. They won't have followed the character. It's like picking up a, a series in the middle. I have found that um, I tried to pick up Batman. I, I, there's so many Bat characters now. Yeah. Right. I love Batman. <laughs> I love Batman, and I, I wanted to understand it and read it. I got a DC comic subscription, and I was just trying to get on board, and it was so hard. To even get on board with Batman, yeah, which should be very accessible, should be. But there's, it's just like an, it's an epic thing. It's like uh, joining Game of Thrones in season five. You just, you have no idea what's going on. Oh, Plugo's got a mushroom emoji hat. That's what his hat looks oh, that's like. That's pretty like, neat. Yeah, you know, like he's something out of Nintendo. So, Mike, <laughs> what we've come up with tonight, or what I've come up with, and what I'm going to ask you to react to is uh, my list of recommendations for helping people to get onboarded uh, if you're a non-comic reader. You have a friend uh, who says, hey, you create comics. Can you recommend a comic? You have a significant other in your life that's like, I want to try and read comics. What can I read? Um, I've put together a series of questions and some recommendations, uh, and I'd like to get your reaction on them. What do you think? All right. Do it. All right. So people from the studio audience, uh, feel free uh, to let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, We are always happy to hear from you. (laughs) There they are. They are. A lot of people. A lot of people here tonight. (laughs) That's true. Mike, easy there. Actually, the minute I hit that sound effect, we lost a viewer. (laughs) James McGill, Bone. You know, oh. out of context, James, that is, <laughs> it is a comic book series, everybody. Bone is a comic book series, and James recommends it. And uh, we absolutely adore James and his recommendations. I guess we'll be pulling these up as we are. friend who reads widely, including comics, just discovered R. Crumb's Old Testament. What do I recommend to follow that? Well, we will help you with that, Plugo, because we have a process for helping to suss out what you should recommend. So let's get started, Mike. Uh, First tonight is Hat Month. Uh, We decided that Hat Month would be uh, a way uh, to honor um, someone important in our lives. Um, I uh, wore my my father's hat in one of the episodes, and I want to honor the man that influenced me deeply, Garib Sheamus, who (laughs) gave me this hat personally. Did he really? I don't know. Did he? I, I, <laughs> Sounds good, though. I may have just stolen it out of the warehouse. Yeah, we were like, just like that's what we all did. If anything was not bolted down, we just took it home. <laughs> hey, there's a hat. Can I have it? Sure. And Mike, did you buy that hat for for Hat Month, or you had this? Uh, this one I got free um, when we did the <laughs> Robot Chicken DC special. We got to to go through their closet, and I pulled that hat. Right on. Yeah. That's the benefit of knowing Jeff Johns, isn't it? Yep. There you go. All right. So, Mike, here's what. Here's what we're going to do. How to recommend comics. Now, this is a squirrel uh, reading the newspaper. Uh, very topical. Smart squirrel. squirrel. Yeah. Um, but that hat looks awfully familiar. Uh, do you, which hat, James? Mike's hat or my hat? Did you? Maybe, maybe the mushroom hat. Maybe the mushroom hat. I, I think he means my hat. I probably sent him one. Okay, so Mike, the first thing I do is I ask this question. What are the last two or three good movies you've seen or the last two or three good books that you've read? Oh, the fedora. Nobody has a fedora. Who has a fedora? Uh, maybe the, the hat on the previous screen. Oh, oh, the hat on the previous screen. Yeah, yeah that's, that's James's trademark. That's right. So um, maybe that's where I was inspired from. Oh, so Mike. 
Um, do you can you tell me the last two or three good books or movies that you've read if you were if you were put on the spot and if I were trying to help recommend comics to you? Yeah, the last really good book I read was called uh, Children of Time by <laughs> Adrian Tchaikovsky. It wasn't a time travel thing. Oh no, was, oh no, because it had it time, time in the title thing. and I just I couldn't. It was a, it was a cool space uh um you know terraforming a planet thing. I would yeah. highly recommend that to anybody. Yeah, I threw up a little in my mouth when you said <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't time travel. You know, actually, it's interesting that you said that, Mike. Um, one of the last really good books that I read was also a sci-fi book. Um, did you read uh, Recursion no. by Blake Crouch? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. And I'm reading, uh, and you, you really should check it out because this is perfect for both you and me. It's for people with short attention spans. They're novellas. They're only that thick. And they're called The Murderbot Diaries. They take place in the far future and uh it's uh, told through the pov of a well of a robot that is a security robot that's been designed to kill oh wow that's interesting. right but so both of us we we really uh seem to like science fiction so right there that's a really good clue now uh, people might talk about romance uh movies hallmark channel um, they might talk about historical fiction. They might talk about, oh, I really enjoyed this documentary uh, and I, I prefer nonfiction. I think one of the key things is find out what that person likes and then what are the last two or three good movies that they've seen or the last two or three good books that they've read. It's a good, good question. Yeah, two or three is a good is a good starting point. Um, I use Goodreads. I don't know if you use Goodreads, but I was on Goodreads for a while. Yeah, it's very helpful to know what next read you're going to to get into. So I go to Goodreads a lot to figure out what my next read will be. But I also use it to record exactly what I've read and what I liked and didn't like. Um, I read a thriller called No Exit. Um, modern day thriller, just good from beginning, middle and end. Uh, Mary Ann just joined us. Hey, hey, hey. Nice to see hey. you there, Mary Ann. I hope you are also wearing a hat. Mike, I believe in French, that's chapeau. Is that right? <laughs> it's pretty good. Pretty good, bud. Does anybody speak French in our audience? I don't know. Okay. So first thing you want to do is ask the squirrel, what are the last two or three things you've read? Now, I wanted to show, Mike, it's a little hard to see, um, but if, uh, if you're watching YouTube, you can blow it up full screen. I went on Wikipedia just to see, like, what are the genres of science fiction? Did you know that there were this many genres? I did not. I would have said there was just one science fiction. Right. But, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm like, oh, it's post-apocalyptic. It's, uh, you know, you like time travel. Time travel didn't even make it on this list. Then this uh, is a bad list. This is a bad list. This is from uh, Wikipedia. There's a lot of stuff on here. I look at this and I'm like, mathematical science fiction. I'm like, what? How is how is grotesquery in science fiction genre? I don't know. And I what happens at, after cyberpunk? Well, P, post-cyberpunk. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what, what, you know, what happens after that? Buggle up, buggeroo. And sci-fi is kind of nutty. I think, you know, things that you might not think about. Like, I think about post-apocalyptic. That's my genre. I like yeah. post-apocalyptic. It's not here, but it, I think it's apocalyptic fiction. Yeah, po what's, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic. What's Skiffy? What is it? Skiffy. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. But anyway, so if you ask somebody that the, if they like science fiction and they know the word Skiffy, suddenly you've started a very interesting conversation where you can say to somebody, what is it? And then you can start to match with... Uh, someone else uh, sounds like is Skiffy steampunk. I guess maybe it's steampunk. Maybe I don't know. These are screenshots. They're not active links. Um, I've learned my lesson of trying to pull up websites. <laughs> They're just screenshots. A few minutes of preparation saves us a whole lot of time. Um, furthermore, I I, I did want to oh. show you this, Mike. I I went into Wikipedia and tried to find. Uh, oh, look at this. The it's missing the post-colonial sci-fi. Plugo, That's, of course, you know. That is a good genre right there. That is a good genre. And uh, Plugo, we might want to recommend. If you want to put it in the uh, in the, in the the stream there, Plugo, your, um, your own Kickstarter, uh, which was a 
mashup of genres, Mike. A, a mash. Media mashup. But so what do you think here? This is this is something I also pulled off of uh, Wikipedia, showing the different types of time travel, which I personally do not appreciate. And you, you hate. are yeah, you're you're something of aficionado, aren't you, Mike? Yes, I love the time travel. So many ways and things to think about and discover it makes your brain really work. So I understand butterfly effect. What is time tourism, Mike? Uh, that I don't know. I would I would assume it's uh, you know being able to go back to say, just say the Civil War, just to see what was happening. Ah, and what about time pair of ducks? Time pair of ducks. That's the crazy one. Where if you it's the kind of the grandfather um, effect thing. Like if you go back in time and kill your grandfather, how can you be born to go back in time to kill your grandfather? It leads to a paradox. Makes your brain hurt sometimes. It doesn't. I just well, it depends listening. on how you think of time, though. The time I don't, lines, alternate realities. It's, yeah, it's it's, it's it, it is the dullest genre. <laughs> it's. <laughs> it has so many avenues. I don't understand how you can think it's dull. Here's why it's dull. Because it's all, and I'm probably going to pronounce it incorrectly. Feel free to make uh, fun of me for not pronouncing this correctly. But it's Deus Ex in Mahina, which is God is in the machine, which is how writers solve a problem by having this like, you know, miraculous solution at the end of uh, Act 3. And they were like, oh, it was this. And you're like, oh, it was time travel. Hmm. Time travel to me is like often a, just a cheap out. Well, what about Terminator? Do you like Terminator? I love Terminator, but that's time travel. But, well, yeah, all right, you're right. I also <laughs> like that one with uh, Chris time tourism. Pratt. Yes, exactly. Chris, Chris Pratt. Um, Chris Pratt uh, has that one on uh, Netflix. Uh, the the Time War or something. Oh yes, that was uh, it was it was fun. It was fun. I thought um, it was great, but you know I'm a big Pratt fan. So did you ever see the episode of Futurama when they time warped to Roswell, New Mexico in 1947? That answers the grandfather paradox. I did not see that one, but I'll have to look it up. Yeah, I feel like we should be hanging out with Glenn Catilla at a pub somewhere. <laughs> Catilla, you got to come on the show with us one day. Okay, so Mike, I just wanted to show all the different things. Oh, wait, James just added. They recently figured out mathematically how you can kill your grandfather without going all Marty McFly. I, I, yeah, I'd like to to see how they could figure that out, but it all depends on how you look at time and how time actually works. Because if it's one straight line, then you run into the grandfather paradox. But if it's alternate realities, as soon as you jump back to kill your grandfather, you've created a, another timeline. So killing your grandfather in that won't affect you. See, I stopped listening. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Third it right off. Oh, perfect. Uh, great low-key time travel yes. primer. Primer's the yeah. name of it. I don't know if it's primer or primer. Primer? Yeah, it's yeah. It could be one or the other. Well, I think, I think the card is primer. I would I think it's primer too, but someone one told me it was primer. Well, it depends on if you're from London or if you're from New York. You're from New York, it's primer. I don't know. It was a good one though. You should watch it. It wasn't it. Fry is his own grandfather. Oh, oh, well. What does that mean? Is that a um, Futurama reference? Apparently, yeah, Futurama. Yeah, apparently there was a, a grandfather thing. Time travel of the tech startup. Plugo, that's your next Kickstarter. Ooh. That's actually not bad. Maybe a good Plugo, one. Plugo just, just announced his new Kickstarter. You can fund it. Okay. <laughs> Second question. What genres tend to interest you? So we just talked about what genres interest you. One of the things that um, – do you remember um, – it's from a long time ago, Mike. We probably uh, do you remember when there were bookstores? Um, like buildings, yeah, and video stores. Do you remember those again? Those, like, uh, like buildings that you went into and got your things, those historical things. <laughs> uh, hold those on, things that are in museums. Go, go tell the fry solution kill your pop up and sleep with his girlfriend. Turns out that is grandma. I don't know if that would actually work, but it is a good, it is a good solution. It just makes me want to hang out with Glenn Gatilla even more. That's all. That's all I have to say. Gatilla <laughs> should be hanging out with us, and uh, I think he's good. But so anyway, Mike. So remember, you would go to the video store, right? Yeah. And you know there was the new wall, the rack of new movies. And after you were like, ah, oh, there's nothing there. Which section did you wander to? Did you did you go to the romance? Did you go to the 
nonfiction history? What, what were you? Uh, I would usually go to either comedy um, or like sci-fi or like action, something like that. So comedy is the last thing I go to. Anytime really? I'm watching Netflix, I see comedy. I just go. Boop. Oh, well, just that's because you're funny as it is, so you don't need any more comedy. But you know, but I don't enjoy that much comedy. I, in fact, probably the most comedy I watch is because I'm watching it with Jen and my wife. Um, I just, I, I just don't watch much comedy. So if there was a comedy time travel movie, you would just completely erase it from your mind. Um, I actually went to the movies based on a recommendation from you called Hot Tub Time Machine. Oh, <laughs> I physically left the house, and it is indeed <laughs> one of my favorite movies. There you go. See, absolutely love it. Uh, combining two things that I don't shop for at the <laughs> video store: time travel or um, comp. But, so I tend to like crime, mm -hmm. um, and I don't tend to like. Uh, I like thrillers, but I don't like. It's his last day in the CIA. He's the best ever, and you know, like I'm just not that interested. I can't relate to the best ever. What I can relate to are petty criminals. <laughs> just, that, just, the, that, just the run of the mill kind of goofy criminals. They're all right where you go. Right. Like I totally can relate to that. I, I And I do like uh, sci-fi. But if I look at the sci-fi, I am very uh, into great special effects to the point where sometimes the movie isn't even that important to me. I'm just I go for the special effects. Right. James asks, did you see Hot Tough Time Machine 2? I did not. Did you watch that, Mike? Of course I did. How was it? It wasn't as good as the first one, but it, it had its moments. Do you know Horrible Bosses and Horrible Bosses 2 were both very good? They were. I, they I were mean, obviously, good. Horrible Bosses was better, but it was uh, still a good movie, Horrible yep. Bosses. I haven't seen Hot Tub Time Machine 2. So I I don't, I don't know if I... So you would go to the what section, Mike? You'd go to comedy. comedy? What else? Or sci-fi. Usually, Probably or action like adventure kind of, and then when they combine two of them, right? Yeah, like what was that Tim Tim Allen one where they uh, they they was like they were on the set of Star Trek. They it, it oh um real, yeah. See now I've just gone completely blank. Uh, I could see see it in my head. Sigourney Weaver, Sigourney Weaver, right? Alan Rickman, it'll come to you. What is that movie? Audience, tell us what this. Um, Oh, Marianne what says, why can you relate to the petty criminal? Because hashtag like-minded <laughs> birds of a feather flock together. Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Galaxy Quest, is that it? That is it, yep. So, yes, I do. I like petty criminal stories, but I also like, and Mike, you've been helping me on that outline that we showed uh, uh, two episodes ago. Um, my crime story has definitely taken a more uh, humorous turn. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I like crime that has some humor in it. Uh, stand up guys, I just watched it the other night, and the nice guys, I just rewatched that. Was that. A really good one. Yeah, yeah, they're both really good. I like that uh, comedy and drama and animation. Okay, so that's a good example. Like, so if we were to be speaking with Maryam and she said, "Oh, you know what? I like comedy and drama and animation." Now I would have some sort of clue. So now we we're starting to narrow down a little bit. All right. This is an important question. Are you looking to explore the source material from a movie slash television show? So you get hooked on The Walking Dead. I'd love to see, read those Walking Dead comics. Do you recommend The Walking Dead comics for people who've enjoyed The Walking Dead television show? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've never read the comics, so I, I couldn't I couldn't say. In my case, I read the comics first. And then thought the show did such a terrific job with it that I was like, you you have to check this out. Um, you know, 30 Days of Night, another really good horror movie, underrated indie horror movie. The comics are a lot different. So if you really enjoyed that, you might not enjoy the comics. If you watched The Batman, you might not enjoy the Batman comics. It's just That's true. Yeah. It's hard to get into the Batman comics. Yeah. If you watched Watchmen, Watchmen is very loyal to the comics. I would say, yeah, go back to the comics. But I think the problem with the Watchmen comics is that at the time when it came out in 1986, it was revolutionary because it deconstructed superheroes. It said, what would it be really like 
for superheroes to live in the real world? What would it really be like to have superpowers? Now you're recommending this to people and this stuff has been long since covered. Mm -hmm. It's not as disruptive anymore. Yeah. So you have to help somebody to say, what did you see? Did you watch the Daredevil show, Mike? You saw Daredevil, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. It, could you recommend Daredevil to somebody right now? Uh, the comic, no. It's, I mean, again, it's like Batman or anything. It's it's such an epic run that they wouldn't be able to figure out who's who and what's what. Where would you start? You know, the comic series over 50-something years old. Yeah. Where do you start? Do you start with Frank Miller? Do you go to Bendis? Where do you go? Moon Knight, recently on Disney+. Plus. Hawkeye, recently on Disney+. Plus. Can you hand somebody those comics confidently and say, give that a shot? Yeah. It's it's tough. They're they're too big. They are big. I, I will say uh, that something like Hawkeye, if you pick up the correct run of Hawkeye, or the correct run of Moon Knight, you could have a great experience. But there's so many different runs to pick up. You yeah. Pick up the wrong one, and somebody's going to be really unhappy. So James says, when jumping onto any comic that has a lot of back catalog. From the start of the podcast, start reading when a new writer starts or pick up the start of the most recent writer. I, I agree. It, it's better to start at a new arc. Yeah. But it's sometimes it's hard to do that. Like you, you're looking at this wall of trade paperbacks. They're priced at 24 to 29.99. If somebody wants to buy it, where do you start? Do you do you know if it's in the middle of somebody's run? Do you know if it's in the beginning? So as somebody who's making that recommendation. I think James is right. I would recommend the beginning of the Brian Michael Bendis run. Okay. Right? So now we say, does one even recommend current floppies versus TPPs or GNs? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to clarify this because I think this is a really important thing. So first of all, Mike, wow. do you, what is the difference between uh, each of these uh, formats? Um, the floppies, I'm assuming, are single issues. Uh, trade paperbacks are the collected issues, and I don't know what GNs are. Uh, graphic novels. Oh, well. So there's a slight differentiation. Yeah. TPBs tend to be a collected. GNs tend Marvel. to be intended to be a, a standalone story. And floppies are something completely different <laughs> for a different show. <laughs> it's a totally different show. Um, can you recommend current floppies versus TPBs or GNs? I find it hard to recommend a monthly book because... If somebody's not in the habit of going back to the store, they, they might not. Oh, that's that was I read this issue of Spawn. Now, what? <laughs> you're like, when you go back next month and you read another issue, really? Like, it's hard to recommend a floppy. There's not a lot that are standalone. They're not a lot that are intended to stand alone. Some of them are anthologies. There are a lot of younger reader stories, Mike. Uh, that are standalone. You know, Marvel and DC do younger readers. They are self-contained. But an adult coming to you might say, oh, I didn't get a lot out of it. It was like YA. And you're like, well, yeah, it was for kids. I tend to recommend trade paperbacks and graphic yeah. novels. Yeah, because they, they, you know, if you do just say the, the Frank Miller run on, you know, whatever it is, it's that collected right there. It's right there ready for you. Instead of you having to go to the store once a month, it's kind of like the same watching TV. It's, you know, watching one episode or binging. Trade right. paperbacks, you can binge. Right. I binge every night, Mike, but not with <laughs> television. It's just, you know, I used, to, <laughs> I used to read and then watch, but it's one of the other now. The difference got my nerves. My kid reads, watch the TV shows, and we'll have a comparison dialogue with his friends and me. That sounds like awfully deep dive, Mary. I'm like comparing the dialogue from the comic to the show. It's too much. <laughs> it feels like a lot of work. <laughs> feels like a lot of work. Um, hold on. Uh, James recommended Marvel Unlimited. Yes, I subscribe to Marvel Unlimited and DC uh, Unlimited as well to get to read a lot of comics. So uh, are we slipping into the manga versus Western Ooh. comics thing? Well, it's a good question. Mike, do you have any manga that you've recommended to anybody ever? I haven't read a lot of manga, so I couldn't really recommend anything there. I have not either. And I always feel badly when somebody says, oh, I really like uh, anime or I like uh, animation. And, you know, what can you recommend? And I'm like, I recommend you go talk to somebody else. 
<laughs> not even for the comics. Just I don't even just talk away. to somebody else, but we're done here. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like we were always, uh, what we would say, Western mainstream, particularly during yeah. our time working at Wizard. Uh, even just look at our attire, right? We got Wizard, yeah. we got the Flash. I was always um, interested in manga, read a little bit of it, but um, I could never get past that reading backwards thing. <laughs> From the back of the book first, you know, because you have to read from the back of the book first. Um, yeah, see, I don't even know that. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad we're on the same show together. <laughs> Good thing we were prepared. Yes, as always. You no, know, it's Marvel's Netflix style digital comic service. Marvel's Netflix. Right, what? Right, Marvel Unlimited. Right. I, I I subscribe to it. It's uh, it's not very expensive, but I will tell you, um, you can get a lot of new books. And you can get a lot of uh, back issues. I will tell you, I subscribed to DC uh, and I paid for it. And then I put a whole bunch of issues into my queue to read. And then DC came out with a higher level. So there was like the, I don't know, the, the $49 a year level, which I paid for. And then they came out with a $79 a year level that had even more better selections. But you know, the ones that were in my queue became unavailable at my level, I had to go up to upgrade to the $79 level. And you know what I did? You upgraded. I canceled my subscription. Well, good for you. See, I would have, you should have written them a harshly worded letter. And then... I'm going to write them a firm tweet. <laughs> but I did. I was like, oh, come on. Yeah, I got to 20 bucks. Crappy. I was halfway through a series and they, they, they locked it at the $79 level. $79, a lot of money. You should, well, yeah, you should have actually written them a letter. They probably would have grandfathered you in. I'm not old enough to be a grandfather, Mike. I'm still a young man. So manga is like that. Other countries read from right to left. Right. I, I mean, and that's part of the problem with the manga. For me, it's not a problem for manga in general. But for me, I, I, I'm, I was having trouble knowing. So when you start from the back of the what we would consider the back of the book, am I supposed to read from the top right to the left and then down to like I could never figure it out. And I was always getting confused. So. If I have to put any effort into it, I'm out. <laughs> I'm just out. Too much work. I'm done. Gatilla's on it. He says, it's a pain to read if you grew up reading Western style. I discovered comic via Dark Horse. Their stories seem to bleed into each other plot and thematically. So, yeah, Dark Horse uh, did import a lot. And that was actually where I had gotten a lot of my exposure to manga. When we were at Wizard, we would get the free comics from dark horse i'd bring them home i'd give them a read we read everything we had massive amounts of free stuff free that's the free. best price. okay so now we're asking if they wanted to continue with the source material sometimes it's an easy answer like you know walking dead or the boys very consistent with um the comic but daredevil looks completely different in the comics um and uh from the television show same theme same characters but if you watch the television show and then you make the transition to red spandex, it might be hard. Or the X-Men movies, you know, the characters in the X-Men comics are fully costumed in the movies. They're wearing adaptations of costumes, right? So it's a little tricky. You're going to have to use your best judgment. Number four. Oh, look at that. Four and five went. Inside. Yeah, they went together. Offer the let them sample your comics. Um so I will, if I know somebody, um, I, when we used to go to think, Mike, do you remember we used to go to an office? Mm. It was like when we used to go to video stores. Go to one of those buildings, right? <laughs> it's a big <laughs> building where people <laughs> went to work. Um, I would often give people, you know, comics a sample. I, I had a coworker. Uh, she had said, oh, I was always interested in uh, checking out some comics. What recommendations do you have? And I ended up, uh, bringing in the complete run, one trade paperback at a time, of Preacher, Ooh. which she just thought was terrific. Preacher was 75 issues, mm -hmm. every issue, and I felt like that was a great entree. I'm not sure how much she continued to read after that, but it was a great entree. And, of course, the Preacher TV show came out. Um, I didn't, didn't, it didn't stick for me. Did you try the Preacher TV show? I didn't show? see that. No. Yeah, it didn't stick for me. Um, it was pretty good, but it just didn't hold me. Hmm. Um, a, a lot of people, I will give something like concrete. Remember concrete? 
Oh, yes. A long time ago. My all time favorite. Yeah. Um, I would give them Why the Last Man, another TV show that didn't stick. Did you try yeah. watching? I didn't watch the TV show, but I wanted to. And then when I found out they canceled it, I said, I'm not going to watch it now. Uh, I got, I, Janet got Hulu. Um, she wanted to watch uh, Kardashians. <laughs> so there's a lot on there. So I tried Hellstrom. I tried Why the Last Man. I was so disappointed. I just yeah. thought, you know, Sandman. Well, Sandman was good on that. Sandman was a good show, yeah. Sandman was and good. a good and a good run. Yeah. And actually, you if somebody enjoyed the Sandman television show, you can hand them those trades and I think that would really resonate with them. Yeah. Yeah. It's very consistent. Um, so further back to this, Mike, uh, pretending you didn't see number five, um, get feedback and adjust, adjust your recommendations. I think the key thing is that when somebody is saying, ah, oh, this didn't work for me, you don't want to let them give up. If they've shown an interest, you can, you can give them one or two floppies. You can give them a complete trade. But if you're giving them your comics and they're returning them to you, the best thing you can do is say, let me bring you something else and give them a chance because, you know, they might not have connected with that, but they might connect with the next thing. And it's your responsibility as a comic book aficionado expert to help them discover something that they want. It, it's a big responsibility, isn't it, Mike? It is. It's it's you know, it's a weight on your back. It is a weight on your back. <laughs> All right. Last one. Hot tip. And I'm going to give you some examples. Mike, have a few standard recommendations that don't require prior reading slash watching exposure. So what do I mean by that? Hmm. What, say, what do you mean by it, that? It means that you, you have to have some right in your back pocket. Waiting to what? go. Your your go to uh, for people who like superheroes who wanted to jump in was always Astro City. Astro City, fantastic, fantastic. Never never a dull issue. Always uh, worked. My go to was Concrete. Mm -hmm. ne never a fail. Um, I think you need to have a couple of in your pocket with that you know and you're confident that the quality is high. You just can't recommend any issue. There's just number one, there's just too many issues of the X universe or the spider universe. Which one do they read? It's too much. It would it would melt your brain. It would melt their brain. Melt their brain. So, Mike, if, if you don't mind, I would like to show you a few of my standard recommendations and to the audience get theirs. And uh, if they like it, I'd like to hear the sound of their There you go. All right. <laughs> Found one sound effect and I'm going to use it forever. All, All right. Need. So tell me what your thoughts, your reactions as we do this. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. My first, I'll do them. Oh, look, go to recommendations. Go to recommendations. That's a good, a good <laughs> right there. So uh, I actually uh, got this show idea from a person that I met at a marketing conference, and I recommended Rachel Rising uh, based on her feedback and, and what she said she liked. She absolutely loved Rachel Rising. So that's Terry Moore. And I said, why don't you start with the ultimate source material from Terry Moore, Strangers in Paradise? What do you think of these recommendations? Have you read either of these, Mike? Um, I've read... Um, I'd say most of Strangers in Paradise. Uh, I've never even heard of Rachel Rising, um, but I, it's Terry Moore, so I would give it a shot. Yeah, Rachel Rising is essentially a uh, story about Rachel, who wakes up in a shallow grave in the woods with ligature marks around her neck. She is dead, but alive, uh, not zombie-like. We've, we've all been there. We've all been there in a good <laughs> night of drinking. Um, and people, uh, and she has to go try to solve her own murder. It's crazy. It's funny. It is uh, super fun, and I, I recommend it strongly to everybody. I think that's a good one. Uh, I was supposed to say this. Well, there you go. Okay. You do have other sound effects. Can you? I hope people can hear that because it's just you and me. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, you can never go wrong with Rachel Rising and Strangers in Paradise. Incidentally, uh, my friend from marketing um, is uh, enjoying Strangers in Paradise. Her response was, where has this been all my life? Huh? That's a good one. That's a That's good, pretty uh, good response. Yeah. Okay. Give me a little pat on the back. There you go. All right. I have to go like 
take this. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> All right, two more. Uh, once again, uh, these would be related to the media. Um, Walking Dead, if you've never read it, Mike, it's terrific. It really does work on a number of levels. Uh, Kirkman, a young writer at that time, um, it was paced dramatically different from the television show, and yet all the bones were there with Rick and his son and the family. It was truly a family drama and based basically started off with the theory, if there was a zombie apocalypse, what would you do to protect your family? And um, it had an epic run. It ended just a couple of years ago. Uh, there were several omnibuses, but the first one, easy to pick up. The only thing, and Mike, I know that you don't love this, it's in black and white. Yeah, not a fan, but, you know, I, I will read some that are in black and white. Yeah. Um, Mike, have you ever read Why the Last Man? I have not read it. I heard lots about it, but I never read it. Well, let me tell you about it. Why the Last Man is about a uh, character named Yorick, uh, the Shakespearean name for Yorick. I knew him well. well. Um, and Yorick wakes up one day, and he is the last man on Earth. Every male on the planet simultaneously drops dead, except for Yorick and his pet monkey, who is also a man, hmm. man a male, um, and, uh, we have a Y chromosome and the question is, is why the last, the last man? man. <laughs> yeah. So it is a 75 issue run. Every issue is wonderful. Uh, there's not a, there's not a clunker in the entire thing. It, it was a shame that the television show did not, uh, rise up to the quality of the source material. Um, don't know why it just it was paced completely differently, and I was watching it and found myself checking my phone. Mm, that's not good. Not good. Uh, but why the last man? Uh, a terrific uh, political commentary on society and uh, science and all kinds of great stuff. So if you like post-apocalyptic, you cannot go wrong with either of these. So two standard bearers for me. Uh, each one of them has a terrific first issue. In fact, one day, Mike, I think we should break down why The Last Man, perhaps one of the best structured first issues uh, I've ever read. Hmm, that'll give me a good excuse to read it. Good excuse. Okay. Also from the Vertigo line, uh, Preacher. Uh, Mike, have you ever read Preacher? I never finished the whole run, but at the beginning I read, I read a lot of Preacher. And it was great. It's a great story idea. Do you remember what the premise, the basic premise of Preacher was? Um, I believe it was God left, but it gave the preacher his power. Yeah, good memory. Wow. Yes, uh, God left, quit heaven, uh, and uh, his spirit shot down to Jesse Custer, who you see there on the right, who is a preacher from Texas, um, and he got one power, which is the voice of God. If Jesse Custer tells you to something using the voice of God, you have to do it. But it was so much more than that. Uh, it barely touched on the superpowers. His best friend uh, was a vampire. Yeah, he, was, he was funny. That was a good show. He was great. Um, it's such a terrific uh, story. This was, again, early uh, writing by Garth Ennis, where he was really finding his voice. Uh, it is horror. I think the genre is definitely horror, yeah, right? Yeah, lots of, lots of violence. Lots of violence. And crazy stuff. Lots of crazy stuff. Um, last one, uh, Fables. Have you ever read Fables? I believe I have, but I don't remember much about it at all. If I did. So Fables takes the theory that all fables exist and that uh, some of them are able to live amongst us and some of them must live on a farm in upstate New York because they physically or visually look like a fable. And uh, there is a crime, there's a murder, and Big Bad Wolf is the sheriff in town. They call him <laughs> Big B, Big B Wolf. Uh, and with Snow White, uh, they go about solving uh, a crime. And each arc, our six issue arcs, uh, are terrific. You can pick up any arc, but it's better as James noted, to start at the beginning of an arc, wonderful writing. Um, 
Oh, if you liked Pulp Fiction, you'll dig Preacher. Uh, I would I would agree, Plugo. I think that that is a great uh, a great transition. So, almost done. Uh, I love crime. I love street level crime. I I don't like crime where it's like he's the best cat burglar that's ever lived. And <laughs> she's the greatest FBI. I'm like I can't relate. Like I can relate to like people punching each other in the face. <laughs> So, um, okay. wake up. I think he, but did he mean to say welcome or did he mean to say wake up? Wake up, of course. Wake you know, wake, maybe, it's, uh, like, maybe oh. it's, that's another word for hat, chapeau. Chapeau, nanu, nanu. Uh, Sin City uh, is wonderful in that almost everything is uh, self contained, usually uh, three issues, but he has had uh, quite a few. Uh, one shots, and if you ever saw the movie uh, Sin City, it is extremely loyal to the comic book. So if, if that is one that if you saw the movie and you liked it, you'll love the comic, right, Mike? Comic, yes, yes. And I can totally see you loving Sin City. It's your thing. It is my thing. All right. Okay. Um, legendary uh, Mouse, and they make they make kids read it in school. My kids read it. I read it. You read it. Uh, it is uh, known yeah. not in the least of which because it was the only comic book to ever win the Pulitzer Prize Award for fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I've uh, never read it though. Oh, you haven't? I've never read Mouse. Okay, it is an anthropomorphic tale. The cats are the Nazis. The mice are uh, the uh, Jewish people who have been. Uh, enslaved and put into concentration camps, and it is a historical retelling of uh, the author, Art Spiegelman's father, uh, in getting out of, I believe, Auschwitz. Uh, it is unbelievable. It's crushing. It is so heartbreaking to read, uh, and yet it really helps you understand the horrors of war. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to put that one on the list as well. Yeah, if you want to be a little weeper. Yeah. <laughs> Autocorrect for We Three by Grant Morrison. Uh, we Three is a uh, fictional take on, I think, three animals who gain uh, super smart abilities or something, and they go out and fight crime. It is fabulous. It's called We Three by Grant oh. Morrison. Um, but it, it autocorrected and said, wake up. Wake up. <laughs> uh, Marianne said she's also intrigued. She's also intrigued. Um, Mike, I put Planetary on here for you. Uh, Planetary. Have you ever read Planetary? By Planetary, it, the cover looks familiar. Like I would have read it sometime at Wizard, but I couldn't tell you if I did or not. Um, I bet you did. And it was one of the best science fiction comics. Full stop. Um, it is um, basically he takes this idea of superpowered teams that do uh, super science fiction-y adventures. Um, whether or not the science fiction is real or not, it certainly feels real, um, but an absolute delight. Hmm. And a lot of nods to old science fiction movies, uh, including things like Godzilla and King Kong. Like they, He really nods back to that. The art by John Cassidy is stunningly beautiful. Um, so planetary, uh, I'm guessing that's going to go right on your read list. I just wrote it down. I look like you wrote it down. Uh, almost done here. Um, hmm. one of the recommendations that I gave to my marketing friend, the nice house on the lake, uh, as you can see from the lady peeking out from the <laughs> floating bones, it is a horror story. It is current. It's one of the few things that are very, very current. Um, I don't want to give anything away about it, um, but I will say um, that the first three issues are some of the best th three issues of comics that came out uh, last year. Okay. Apparently there's a house and it's on a lake that has skeletons in it. It is. It's, <laughs> it's so good, Mike, you think about not writing ever again. Is it scary, scary? Like if I read it before bed, would I not be able to go to sleep? I, I don't know what what how, what happens when you need to go sleep. I honestly don't know. Planetary excellent deconstruction of every genre behind comics. I like Mike. Now you know why you have to read it because Plugo said excellent deconstruction of every genre behind comics. So right. good stuff. So I'll, I'll um, store it on the list. 
Yeah. Um, I did not see the Disney Plus uh, version of Moon Knight. Did you see it? I did, and it was fun. It was a it good. Was fun. It was a good romp. Yeah, um, I, I didn't have Disney Plus. I still don't have Disney Plus. We had it for a little while. We canceled it, but um, I went back and I read reread this by Bendis and Malieve, and it's terrific. And it's easy to get. Like if you don't read, if you don't read Moon Knight, but you saw the show, easy to jump onto. So it's got some Avengers powers there. It does. Uh, it, it's it's tied into the Marvel universe. The house is nice. Nice, they said. Hmm. Come to the coast. <laughs> All right, where are we? All right. Oh no, that was from last week. I did, forgot to delete that. Forgot to delete that. Okay, <laughs> it's Mike. It's trivia time. Uh, I'll just do a quick one tonight. The yes, the Nazca lines in Peru. Just they are they are lines that you can really only see from high up, and they are they are uh, some of them are just straight lines. Others are um, objects. They have some animals. They got a spider. They got a hummingbird. They have a monkey, and it's just fascinating to me why they were done. Like some people say they were for rituals. Others, you know, say that they were landing sites and patterns for aliens. And I think that you could use a lot of these um, ideas because nobody knows exactly what it was for to just make something stunning. Like perhaps they're locked uh, animals in there and they can come out of there. And, and now you got a giant spider walking around. So when, when, I, when they, when they, this kind, type of thing that's on the ground is called a Nazca line. Nazca lines. Yes. Cause they were in a, a place called Nazca, Peru. And I, what exactly would land in that spider it, shape? It just, you know, it could just be like, you know, it's a, like a windsock. Oh, here's a good landing site if you need to land. Or those, those things they put on the telephone poles that tell helicopters to land there. So uh, this brings back bad memories for Glenn. <laughs> but I just think that these are so cool because you could use them as anything. Like the reason these Nazca lines are here is because of, you know, some ritual where these these giant animals were locked in the ground or they could be an alien thing that the aliens are coming back to recollect the, the planet that they left. There's just so many things that you could you could use. Yeah, no, it's a great spark. And, you know, the fact that you cannot see it at ground level, um, but you can only see it from up in the sky uh, gives you perspective of how big the world is. And I want to ask the audience, what do you guys think? <laughs> they certainly do go on don't they mike sometimes they get a little crazy all right mike and that's it if you like the show uh subscribe if you don't like the show subscribe just anyway just click the button it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything it, you definitely should mike i will see you uh next tuesday and we hope to see all of you be sure to like comment and subscribe oh that's the Spider-Man logo. That's yeah, right. see, there you go. Could have been. So, all right, Mike, have a good one. I'll see you next week. Bye. Right.